Uh, for you first time visitors, uh, One Million Cups is a weekly educational program uh, hosted by the Kaufman Foundation. Um, each week we have two entrepreneurs come and present their journey uh, about the companies that they've started. Essentially they'll speak for six minutes um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A for another 15 to 20 minutes. So without further ado, we'd like to bring our first uh, speaker to the stage. His name is Michael Wilson and he owns a company called Nile. And now is a luxury goods company that's on a quest to create the next American luxury brand. I'll let Mike tell you more about it. Thanks, Milton. How is everyone today? I'm glad you actually came out, because I was assuming with all the rain that there'd be maybe five or six people here. So it seems like it's a pretty good turnout. My name's Mike Wilson. I'm the founder of Nile. Nile is a company that's on a quest. We're on a quest to develop the next great luxury brand right here in America, and specifically right here in Kansas City. And we're starting with luxury timepieces. People often ask me why luxury timepieces, and that's a great question. I'll explain that here a little bit later. But I want to, before we go deeper, talk a little bit about a few core things about our company that really drive who we are and what we do. And those three things are one, conquer for good. It's a concept that we have that we believe it is okay to be successful. It is okay to relentlessly compete in the marketplace, but you should also do that ethically, and you should also give back. And so we have a very core foundation of us of working with entrepreneurs and giving back within the community as a core philosophy of our company. Another one is craft with honor. Crafting with honor for us as an American company means looking to source things in America, produce things locally when we can, produce things in Kansas City when we can. And as a showcase here in a few minutes, I'll show you the Nile One, our debut product, which is a showcase of the American production that we've uh, managed to achieve. And the third thing is being all-inclusive. As a luxury goods fashion brand, we believe that it is important to embrace the diversity and culture of mankind and reflect that within our photography and the things that we do. And that may seem like a normal thing to do, but in the fashion and luxury goods industry, that uh, seems to be completely absent in modern times. A lot of people ask me, why did we produce a luxury watch? And that's a really great question because it's really difficult to do. Um, and that's one part of it. But another part of it really stems from a personal passion for watches, paired with a, a background in manufacturing and a really a love for American muscle cars. And I have this 1968 Corvette, which you'll see up in the upper right corner. And it's loud and somewhat obnoxious. And, it's got great classic design to it. It made me fall in love with the old American mechanisms that we used to build. And with the days of modern day electronics and electric cars, this is a timeless American piece that just never goes out of fashion. And that's really what inspired Nile to go in the direction that we did. So as we, we looked at building luxury timepieces, we learned a couple things. I want to share a couple facts that we found out in this process and on our quest. One of them is 60% of consumers in America as well as China, are willing to spend 10 to 80% more for a pro luxury product that is made in America. And what this made us realize, seeing the statistic, was that there must be some value in things that are American made. People must respect the hard path that people have to go through to build things in America. And so we got in our mind that, okay, this seems like a good perspective to build something here in America, a luxury timepiece. And then we got into what's the potential of this. We learned that 23 out of 25 of the top luxury timepiece time companies are actually luxury companies. So that means by revenue, so many of these brands you'll see here, by revenue, these are your top 25 brands. Only two of them sell products for less than $3,500. So for us, we saw, okay, there's an opportunity to build this thing in America, but we need to build it really well. We need to build a phenomenal product. And we don't want to be a low cost, low price leader. We want to build something people want to pay. So our debut product is the Nile One. Before I talk about the Nile One, I want to tell you a little bit about what we want to represent. One with the company, but as well as the product. We want to represent and we want to focus our time and energy on representing those that are all in. This is a core concept for us, and you'll hear me say it a lot. All in is a lot of the people that are here today. It's myself. It's Alec Matlock, it's all these people that are relentlessly and passionately looking to succeed. The ones that are out building their ideas, the ones that stay up late at night and get up early in the morning to follow their dreams and the passion. It is the modern day entrepreneur. And these people 
are what drive America, and that's what we want to represent as the best of America, the people that drive it. So this concept of all in is what we want to represent. And you'll find in the luxury goods industry, you'll find companies that reflect aviation or diving or just general cultural status. This is where we want to be. So here's a, a first shot you see of our product. What's interesting about this is that we've been on a quest to figure out how to build this in, the, in America. And now we have a product that is 93.3% made in America by components. It's a very bold, classic design. We've gotten a lot of really great feedback from customers and people in the marketplace with it. And what's interesting is figuring out how to build your own watch. Uh, you can either ship it to somebody else and do it all and just show up at your facility and uh, package it up and sell it online, but we are actually crafting each individual component with partners all over America. Um, with all stainless steel construction and one real unique piece is this is the first non-touch application for Corning Gorilla Glass. The glass that is on this watch is uh, Corning Gorilla Glass, which is a very exciting company to work with in the production of this. And furthermore, we figured out how to build a luxury timepiece in a just-in-time manufacturing uh, set up to where we don't have to invest to buy 10,000 watches to, in order to turn a profit, or if there's an error with it, be able to iterate and make a better product. So when you order a Nile 1 today online, we start the manufacturing process tomorrow, and in three to five weeks, you get your product. And so we're able to literally one-off craft a luxury timepiece. At the core of what we do is transparency. As I talked about, we make it in America, but we also tell you where we made it in America. So you'll see a map here, which is actually interactive on our website. You can go through and component by component learn where we make things. We make our dials here in Lee Summit. We assemble things in Kansas City. So at the core of us is this transparency, and we want to share this experience of what we're building. And uh, one of the most exciting parts of this is we take all the components that we build in America and bring them right here to Kansas City. We polish them, assemble them, test, and ship them right in the crossroads at 1810 Cherry, which is the uh, Engineology Accelerator, which is one of our strategic partners. So um, we've managed to figure out a very difficult path and get down to a place where we're producing things right here in Kansas City. A lot of people ask me, where are we going with this? You, you've built one luxury timepiece, that's great, but what's next? The future for us is in three things. One, expanding our current product lines in order to appeal to a more mass crowd. Our current design is a very bold design, but it appeals to a specific group of individuals. Um, that is one piece of it. The other piece is a sister brand that we want to create called Karen. Right now, Nile is an all men's line. And we believe, as earlier, being all inclusive, we want to create a brand that represents strong women. We didn't really want to create watches that are rhinestone with pink roses and all sorts of things that we as men think women want. And so we're producing a, a sister brand named Karen that focuses on strong women. So next year you'll see the expansion of us into uh, women's timepieces and goods. And then beyond that, I say that we want to create the next luxury goods company. We didn't say we wanted to create the next great timepiece company. So for us, our biggest growth is competing in a bigger pool. It's competing against some of the most valuable brands you've seen, like Louis Vuitton and Zara. So for us, the real beauty is being able to move beyond current product lines and expand that into more US-made, well-crafted luxury items. I get asked a lot, how can you help? How can, how can I help you guys? I'm really excited, how can I help you? And the best thing everybody here could do is help us share our story. Uh, we've got a story about American manufacturing and producing here, and we're producing some really great products, which afterwards I'd love to show you this if you want to come up and look at our packaging and play with the watch itself, happy to show you. But share our story, tweet it, interact with our brand. Um, buy me lunch or a bottle of scotch and ask me questions. <laughs> I'm happy to take free lunch uh, or a free bottle of scotch. That's my, probably my personal favorite. So uh, this is the end of the presentation, and we are Niall, and we are all in. Mike, thank you. Thank you. So one of our first questions as we open it up uh, to the audience for Q&A, can you tell us a little bit about your early successes so far? Sure. So we launched our brand um, a couple weeks ago. 
And I had the, it's interesting, story of, of entrepreneurs in Kansas City on a global landscape. This product has now been viewed and purchased globally. Um, and as an early success, I actually, right before I launched this, Nathan Jones, who's the founder of Ag Local, a Kansas City guy, former Kaufman guy, um, him and I have been friends for quite some time, and we reconnected in the production of this watch. And um, Nathan was connected to some very high-level Silicon Valley individuals, VC firms, um, as well as some high-profile and high-net-worth um, celebrities. And Nathan really liked our story and what we were doing. And so Nathan connected us to some very well-known venture capitalists and musical artists and managed to get our timepieces within a very... Um, seeked upon group. And so for us, the early successes have been great. We've gotten a lot of really good feedback, some great press and TechCrunch, um, as well as um, one of our first purchasers of a Nile One is a, um, one of the most well-known venture capitalists in all of Silicon Valley. So we're very excited very early on that, one, we've had the success we have and the tension that we have, but better yet, that a Kansas City native that's out doing big things himself really dipped back into Kansas City to help us get to a national scale and international scale immediately. So um, we just got back from Silicon Valley and it was a great time. Can you also uh, tell us a little bit about your background? I know that um, in designing luxury watches, it's, it's a very meticulous process. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to your designs and so forth? Sure. Um, Designing a timepiece does not mean that you need to be a Swiss certified watchmaker. Um, so often people ask me, are you a watchmaker? And the answer is no, I'm not a watchmaker. Neither is Richard Mill, and he sells $85,000 watches. A little bit different price point. Add a couple zeros uh, to my price point. Um, you know, in this quest for over the past two years, we collaborated with a lot of people, manufacturing companies. Um, people that were watchmakers, engineers. And so going through this design process, we really looked at what's the best thing that would create. And frankly, in the manufacturing process, we chose a very difficult design. Um, you'll notice it has a screw-in bezel. And with a screw-in bezel, you have to take a, they're one millimeter in width. And when you drill a one millimeter hole, you also have to tap and put a thread in that one millimeter hole. And that's really tiny. That's a small of a size of a pencil. And so um, we worked with over 75 companies to find one that was able to achieve this at a price point that we could deliver to the marketplace. So um, the, my background was in manufacturing prior to this, uh, working at a couple manufacturing firms, but the quest to where we are today is really the power of collaboration and the power of American innovation, in my opinion. Mike, I got a question for you back to the left. Yes. Hi, um, I really like your brand and uh, your story as well, really uh, compelling, love that. Um, I have a question for you. You know, I've always kind of considered luxury goods as being dependent on a good American economy, here in the States at least. You know, whenever the economy tanks, it seems like luxury goods are the first thing to suffer a hit because people pull back on those kinds of goods. So uh, my question is, what are the kinds of things, the forward-looking kind of visions you have, things that you're doing to maybe mitigate that dependency on the economy? That's a good question. I'm not an economist, but I'll give you an answer that makes me sound like one. <laughs> um, for us, growth and expansion internationally is really core to what we want to do. Europe is very big on luxury goods. You know, a lot of people have never heard of Zara, uh, one of the largest luxury goods in the world, and they do a lot of business in Europe. For us, we want to expand beyond America because you can't rely just on one country. Um, China, for example, has potentially the largest growth for luxury goods at, for anybody, no matter who the brand is. Fortunately, statistics show that they really like American brands in China. Um, so that really works good for us. But to mitigate our risk on an economic landscape, it's going to be having partners, um, selling online, and being able to be on a more global and international landscape. And frankly, that's going to be the, the best opportunity for us. we got a question in the back right. Uh, are you looking for investment capital? Uh, I'm never, I'm always willing to listen to anyone that is willing to invest. Um, at this time, we have a model where our initial uh, seed funding provided by Ingenology and our other partners 
um, 100% get us to a place where we can scale this company um, and not require outside investment. However, um, we do have some very big visions for what we want to do. Um, right now, we're using a Swiss movement with inside our watch. It's the 6.6% .6 of components that is not American. So we have a very lofty goal of figuring out how to produce an American-based movement. That's something we will need investment capital for. So while NIO may not be something that uh, we take investment with today, I never say no, because uh, you never know when you're going to need the money. Um, but uh, we do have some very lofty goals. So if anyone is interested, I would love to talk over coffee and um, really talk about the big visions for where we, we need help. We've got a question here in the back. Hi, Michael. My name is Shane, and I'm with the company down in Brookside. And uh, we got a contract with Google in May. And what we do is we create Google virtual tours for retail storefront locations. And uh, we can do that for any business, any office space. And I wanted to find out what your strategy was moving forward to actually implement a storefront or a retail location for your product line. Sure. Uh, good question. We've got kind of a, because we're different in how our approach has been to luxury goods, you know, we're housed in an old Springworks factory down at 1810 Cherry. So um, it's a very non-traditional watch company, a luxury goods company that we're producing. Um, right now, we're in talks with a few people uh, that are retail locations. I don't know yet. It is not currently slated for us to open our own boutiques um, like you would see with a Hublot or a, a larger brand. Um, however, we are open to multiple ideas, but for us, we want to change the retail landscape, and we will be starting out with retail locations, working with great high-end jewelry uh, and timepiece companies, but we also want to implement a, a philosophy of what we call ambassadors. How do we create people within multiple cities that are really our brand ambassadors? Not from a traditional thing where you see Leonardo DiCaprio with his hand up taking pictures, not that type of brand ambassador, but um, individuals that can act as a concierge between people that want to buy a product or want to see an early access to other products. And so we've got a lot of things slated. Right now it's growth into um, retail locations, partners, um, but we also do have some big plans for shifting the balance of that landscape through a non-traditional format. Mike, I got a question for you in the back. How's it going, Mike? How you doing? Um, so you talked about community innovation, maybe a little bit of maker community. Can you tell, you know, you had some experiences and encounters with that in Kansas City. Uh, can you tell me some things that you're um, kind of encouraged by and some things that we need to fix as kind of being engaged and consuming of that community? Sure, that's a really great question. Um, one of our big passions is manufacturing, so I can talk forever about manufacturing, but um, when we went to produce this, we wanted to begin in Kansas City. We wanted to figure out how to make a luxury timepiece, crafting metal, CNC, doing the drilling and tapping, everything here in Kansas City. Um, and that just was not possible. We shopped all the major CNC shops and they told us that they wouldn't even bid on it. Um, so the level of precision that we needed, which was down to the micron level, didn't exist in Kansas City. So we went elsewhere. San Diego, San Francisco, LA, Pennsylvania, Dallas, Texas, many other places in order to begin sourcing our components. So from the what we need to work on side is um, pushing ourselves. A lot of companies get into a place where they get into uh, stamping and they don't get into precision stamping or they don't explore the R&D process of that. Um, and so you get very specialized groups that aren't diversified enough that when the market changes or some other technology comes out, they're gone overnight. Um, so for us, we would really love to see more people push themselves integrate new technology and work on the precision side of things. The Swiss and the Chinese are great at precision. Americans are great at large capital equipment. And that's what we've done for such a long time. Um, the things that I've been encouraged by has really been the, the power of the collaboration in this city. Um, you know, working with Engineology has opened up a lot of doors with us. Um, Marco Rennick, who is with Salva Rennick Engineology, he has connected us, and the people that magnetically have been pulled to this has been fantastic. So once we launched this company, everyone in Kansas City has been so supportive. Really, everybody in America has been supportive, um, helping us share our story um, and integrate us with other people and connect us with other people. And so it's been really exciting um, how great of a support system is in Kansas City and working with Mark how great and easy it was for us to get capital early on, 
um, and really help us act as a scalable enterprise rather than a little startup. And uh, that's really, I think, a key thing to the growth of Nile has been acting like an enterprise and not necessarily a classic, what you'd consider a startup. We've got a question for you here in the front. Hey, uh, so last week we had a really great conversation about uh, capital in Kansas City, and I know since you've kind of been, used that traveling back and forth to the coast, can you talk a little bit about maybe what advantages we have here in that world and, and what shortcomings we have, in your sure. opinion? I will say going out to Silicon Valley, they're really savvy. Um, even your normal, everyday person that you see at the coffee bar is savvier than I think 70% of us. Um, it was really mind-blowing. I thought I was on top of my game, and then I'm hearing people throw stuff out about raising funds and all sorts of ratios, and I'm not a math guy, so it kind of just blew by me. Um, but they were very, very savvy in Silicon Valley. However, I, I do believe there's a core difference in the culture of people in Silicon Valley versus here, and that's the difference of playing the money-raising game versus playing the money-making game. In Kansas City, we're worried about how is this going to make money immediately? How is this going to pay back and have an ROI? Uh, what is the path to revenue? How quickly can we get there? In Silicon Valley, it doesn't necessarily matter because there's so much capital to put together. It's all about, can I build this long enough to be an acquisition? And at the acquisition, we're going to get our money. Um, so it was very fascinating because they were very, very savvy, knew how to run companies, great companies. Um, but it was more focused on the acquisition game than the money-making game. Question for you up front. Michael, you're a great communicator. Where'd you learn your skills? Wow, I wasn't expecting that question. Um, I, a, little, a lot of experience, I would say. Um, no formal training. My mother at a very young age, my mother's a teacher at Shawnee Mission School District, and um, she believed it was very, very important for me to learn how to communicate, so she shoved me into speaking opportunities and um, throwing me into small groups of individuals to just talk. So what I'm doing now is just really what I've been forced to do by my mother for many, many years. <laughs> so thank you, Mom. Got another question here in the middle. Good morning. Can you tell us what the origin of the name of the company is? Sure, I would love to tell you that. Um, Niall is a fourth century Irish king, and he's somewhat of a... Um, mythology figure, very King Arthur-like, and I, through a DNA test about a year ago, I found that I'm a direct descendant of this King Nile, myself as well as a, a, a million other individuals <laughs> around all the He's a very prolific man <laughs> of his time, but thank you because I'm here today. Um, but what's interesting is, is Nile, while he's known kind of Genghis Khan-like from the idea of he has lots of descendants, was he was the man, that, first man to unite Ireland into all of what is modern day Ireland. And he created the O'Neill name and the O'Neill dynasty, um, which lasted a thousand years. And so it was this concept of we started investigating him, a lot of mythology and story wrapped behind him of conquering, but conquering for good. You know, he conquered land, but it was always about uniting Ireland. And so there's a lot of things that Niall did that really went into our core philosophy about being all in and conquering for good and, and that type of stuff. And the name Karen was actually Niall's mother, um, which uh, the name Karen itself in Irish mythology means protector of children. And that's where we got the idea of building a brand around Niall's mother's name um, representing strength. Mike, got a question for you in the middle. Uh, good presentation. Uh, first of all, I'm a Rolex guy. I'm sorry about that. Maybe and, I can uh, convert you. <laughs> and I paid a premium for my Rolex just so I could go into a conference room and show off my Rolex and show some sign of success and that kind of stuff. Uh, have you ever thought about joint venturing with some famous name company or something like that? You can still keep your name, but you can call an affiliate of so-and-so to give yourself some name recognition and, and that kind of stuff? Um, you know, for us, the, the, as we've noticed in the timepiece market, it's very um, secluded. So everyone's very siloed and everybody, there's not a whole lot of collaboration that happens between Swiss and Americans or Swiss and Germans. There's a, the Swiss themselves have figured out how to run it like a cartel uh, and, and work with each other very, very well. Um, for us, we view our best way in order to br build brand cachet like you're talking about with Rolex 
where Rolex is a status. You buy one and you're immediately within a certain status within the market. Um, for us, the success we had with Nathan of getting it connected to the same individuals that own Hublots and own Pateks and own Rolexes, we want to be considered um, alongside them or an equal. Um, and that's really on our quest to build an American brand. The last great American watch company was Hamilton Watch Company. Sold out in 1971, I believe. And uh, the Swiss bought them, all their equipment, all their engineers, and moved it all to Switzerland. And so that last great American brand has not been around on coming up on 50 years. And so for us, we've kind of got this uh, ideal that we can build something of equal status to a Louis Vuitton or to a Rolex over time, but right here in America. So it's part of that quest. Um, and that will be through the interjection of our watches in, in culture and um, Hollywood and the other places where we get the buy-in from individuals that like our concept and being all in. So what would you say to those that mentioned that, you know, you're talking about the Swiss and we know that Swiss watchmakers are, are incredible at what they do. Being that you manufacture the, the product here in the United States, how, how do you compare as, you know, as far as like the Swiss movements and things like that? Um, well, it's a really great question. You know, the, the, uh, our specific timepiece uses what is called an automatic mechanical. It means that you wear it day in and day out, and there's a little pendulum that goes around that winds a spring, and it continually keeps time. You never have to have a battery. That's part of the reason why it's expensive, because it's, a bunch, it's over 300 years of mathematics, uh, engineering, and physics jammed together in a 30 millimeter case. It's a wild technology that's built on a bunch of really tiny gears. Um, when you're comparing things, there's all sorts of stuff, like quartz movements that run off batteries that are cheaper, um, me plain mechanical movements that you have to wind that don't automatically wind themselves. And so when you compare them across the world, this technology's been around for 300 years. There's just a handful of people that have the, the, the technology and the equipment and the knowledge to be able to produce it. And so producing it in America, we'll be able to be equal to the Swiss from pure component, pure statistics, how everything works, but it's acquiring that knowledge. The Swiss have over 350 years of accumulated knowledge, and that's really why they dominate the marketplace. And um, the, the Japanese and the Chinese have gotten in that fray back in the 70s. The Americans just haven't done it. And so there are several companies like us on this quest, um, but I think our quest and the people that we've worked with will yield some awesome results in the next few years. Thanks, Michael, for coming out and presenting. Uh, last question for you. How can us as a One Million Cups community help you? The best way to help us is help us share our story. If you know someone we can talk to within the press, if you know, if you can tweet this, if you can just help us share our story and talk to us, talk to the world about this, that is the best thing Kansas City can help us with. Give Michael a round of applause, please. <laughs>